positionally through the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 5, and our focus this morning will be verses 31 to 40. But I'll begin reading in chapter 5 at verse 16. By way of reminder, chapter 5 verses 1 to 15 is uh, an account where Jesus healed a man that was paralyzed. And as a result of his healing him, he told him to rise up, take his mat, and walk. Well, the Jews saw that, and they thought that this was a vile uh, offense on the Sabbath day. So they then question our Lord Jesus, and that's the, the section we're in now. So notice in chapter 5 at verse 16. For this reason the Jews persecuted and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him the authority, or given him authority, to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, and come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself, who sent me, has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Amen. Well, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the written word of the living and true God. We pray now for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who gave us that word. We ask that you would guide and lead our hearts, that you would give us uh, illumina illumination in our minds, that we would behold the glory of Jesus Christ as it's set forth so clearly in John's gospel. Again, forgive us for all of our sin. Open any dead hearts to receive the truth as it is in Jesus, such that sinners may come to him, that they have everlasting life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, the particular context is a display of Christ's glory in the ministry of healing that particular paralyzed man. And so initially, they thought that Jesus was just a Sabbath breaker. 
But then Jesus gave as the rationale for his works on the Sabbath day, the rationale of his father who worked ever since the creation of the world in providence. Now that really outraged them. That really incensed them. Notice in verse 18, it says, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, the theological word, making himself equal with God, is consubstantial. That means one substance with. We already see this in John's gospel at chapter 1. If you notice in chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us, in the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus Christ. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One in substance with the Father. And so the Jews understand his claim in chapter 5, and as I said, it makes them very unhappy. Now they not only want to kill him for what they perceive to be Sabbath-breaking, but they want to kill him for blasphemy. Blasphemy, according to Leviticus 24, was punishable by death. And as far as they were concerned, a man equating himself with, a man asserting consubstantiality with the Father, was a likely candidate to be stoned to death for having committed the sin of blasphemy. So it's very curious as to how Jesus responds. What will he do? How is he going to navigate? How is he going to avoid this particular implication? Well, he meets it head on and confirms it. He tells them, you're absolutely positively right. I am equal with my father. I am consubstantial with the father. And he first indicates that by his relation to the father in verses 19 to 23. And then secondly, by two God-befitting tasks that are his, giving of life and then judgment. And so he does assert that they have charged him, uh, or the, the, the charge that they have leveled against him. What they've said is actually true. And now in this section that we're considering this morning, verses 31 to 40, he calls in witnesses for the defense. Remember, a capital offense has been alleged. Jesus gives his own testimony concerning his relation to the Father, and now he points to witnesses with reference to the defense. So we'll look first at the assurance of multiple witnesses in verses 31 and 32, and then the appeal to multiple witnesses in verses 33 to 40. Notice in the first place the insufficiency of one witness. Look at verse 31, which is a curious statement from one who describes himself later as the way, the truth, and the life. Notice, he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, I think the margin in the New King James is better here, and it reads, valid as testimony. John Gill says, for true here is not opposed to that which is false, but to that which is not valid in law. Turn over to John chapter 8, where we see a similar confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. Jesus asserts in verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Your witness is not valid as testimony. Jesus answered in verse 14 and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true factually, for I know where I come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. In other words, in your confusion, my testimony means nothing to you. But back to John chapter 5, remember the context. They have alleged that he is guilty of two capital offenses. In Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19, the laws of witnesses or the law of witnesses demands two or three witnesses in a capital offense. So for Jesus to say my testimony is not valid in a courtroom is absolutely positively legitimate. So he points to the witness testimony. He points to those who can confirm that what he is saying is in fact true, that he is in fact equal with God, that he is in fact consubstantial with the Father. That's the emphasis that he undertakes, and it shows us just practically in a Western civilization that is abandoning the principle, Jesus regards for due process. 
In other words, there are laws, there are stipulations, there are regulations governing justice in the civil polity. There are laws that must be respected in terms of witnesses and evidences and argument and examination. It really should concern us, brethren, that there is a disregard for that due process that is going on today in the Western world. I know it's going on in not the Western world, but we happen to live in the Western world. And this should alarm us when witnesses and examination and evidences and all of that are subjugated. They're kept at bay instead of bringing them out so that persons can sufficiently be informed concerning a particular matter. So Christ is not saying he's telling falsehoods. He's not saying he's lying. He's only saying that his testimony as a singular individual is not valid in terms of testimony relative to the law of witnesses. Now notice he assures them that there are multiple witnesses in verse 30. He says, there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. That either refers to John the Baptist, about who he's going to presently speak, or the father who he's going to speak, to, uh, speak of later. Either way, doesn't matter. So let's now move to the appeal to multiple witnesses. There are four. You have the testimony of John the Baptist in verses 33 to 35. You have the testimony of Jesus' own works in verse 36. The testimony of the Father in verses 37 and 38. And then the testimony of Scripture in verses 39 to 40. All of these corroborate that Christ is consubstantial with the Father, that he really is equal with the Father. They do that work of two or three witnesses. Notice in the first place the testimony of John the Baptist. Notice the nature of it in verses 33 and 34. He says, you have sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth. Go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and what we call the prologue, John the Apostle sets forth the role of John the Baptist. He does that in chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. Notice, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He then mentions John the Baptist in verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, most likely what Jesus is referring to in verse 33, you have sent to John, is what we find here in chapter 1 at verse 19. Notice, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, that is language that should cause us to reflect. Who are these Jews that happen to be in Jerusalem that send these priests and Levites to, to sort of vet the testimony of John the Baptist? It's the Sanhedrin. It's the highest body of religious and political leadership in the nation at that particular time. And so this Sanhedrin, this formal council, hears about John the Baptist in the wilderness of Judea testifying concerning Jesus Christ, and they wonder, who is this man? What kind of a fellow is he? So they dispatch a delegation to go and figure out who John the Baptist is. So that is what Jesus refers to. Now notice the witness that John bore with reference to their investigation. They first ask him, who are you? And then he confesses and does not deny. He says, I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. And they, of course, say, well, who then are you? He says, I'm the man prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40 at verse 3. I'm the forerunner of the Messiah. I'm the forerunner of the Christ. I am the one that was sent to announce his presence. So this is what Jesus is affirming or alluding to in the witness testimony of John the Baptist. They already knew something concerning Jesus because they had talked previously with John the Baptist. Now, in terms of the witness that John bore to the truth, is what Jesus says in 33b, the witness that John bore to the truth as it is in Jesus is threefold. Now, there are a lot of other things that John the Baptist said, but there are three main emphases that I think Jesus is alluding to in this witness testimony. In the first place, John declared that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So John 1, 29, John the Baptist, when he lays eyes upon Jesus Christ, says, behold, pay attention, look and see, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, this probably doesn't strike you as a very significant statement. But in the Old Testament, the way that Israel came to their God was through sacrifice. 
they would, on a Friday afternoon or on a Saturday morning, grab an animal out of their flock. It was a stipulation that they picked the best animal out of their flock. Not the lame one, not the mangy one, not the loser in the barnyard brawl. But rather they were to, 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 to pick the best of the flock because that's what sacrifice implies. So they would take that particular animal, they would take it to the priest at the tabernacle or temple. The priest would then cut its throat, lay its hands upon it, and then cut it up and offer it up to the living. Well, actually, the, 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 the worshiper would cut its throat and then hand it over to the priest in order to make atonement. This was typical. This prefigured the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle tells us in Hebrews 10 that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. All those things that pointed forward, every lamb, every goat, every pigeon, every animal that was sacrificed in that system spoke concerning this event. And so the Baptist sees him and he says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is God's provision. He is God's remedy. He is God's answer to man's sin problem. The second aspect of John's testimony is in John 1, 34. John 1, 34, John the Baptist describes Jesus this way. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So when Jesus is disputing with these Jews in John 5, and he invokes the witness testimony of John the Baptist, these are things they were already, already familiar with. Not only is the, he the Lamb of God, but he's also the Son of God. And Son of God there in the mind of John, Son of God in the mind of John the Apostle, Son of God in the language of the Lord Jesus Christ, is not Son by creation, it's not Son by adoption, it's Son by nature. Christ is very God of very God. That's the whole debate. That's the whole dispute. That's the whole point. And that's what is unique about Christianity. In every other religion, man tries to get to God. In Christianity, God comes down to man. The second person of the Trinity takes on our humanity with all the essential properties of that humanity and all of the, the, the inf uh, likenesses or, or uh, the infirmities associated with it, and yet without sin. And Christ comes to save us from our sins as the champion, as the Messiah, as the victor, as the triumphant lamb. But the last thing that John testifies is in John 3 at verse 30. Again, the testimony of the Baptist. We've got two Johns here, John the Apostle who wrote John, and then we have John the Baptist of whom John the Apostle is writing. So hopefully you keep that clear after I've made it unclear in your heads. Notice in John 3, 30, he must increase but I must decrease. John the Baptist is a deferring man. John the Baptist understands the preeminence of our Lord Jesus, and John the Baptist is most happy to simply be the friend of the bridegroom who announces the coming of the bridegroom. So back to John 5, when Jesus says, you have sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth, this is what Jesus means. John is a corroborating witness. John's testimony is most blessed. It is consistent with not only what Jesus has said, but also to repudiate the charge of blasphemy in the case of Jesus. Now notice, with reference to our Savior, what he says in verse 34. He says, yet I do not receive testimony from man. Again, a curious statement. Well, then why did you offer up the testimony from man? Jesus, as the Son of God, is not dependent upon the creature. He doesn't need our affirmation. He doesn't need our confirmation. He doesn't need us to validate his claim to being consubstantial with the Father. The creature does. These Jews do. Others of us do. But Christ is not dependent upon the testimony of a John the Baptist to confirm that he is, in fact, consubstantial with the Father. That's what he means in verse 34. But then notice what he says in verse 34. Yet I do not receive testimony from men, but I say these things that you may be saved. In other words, he confirms John's witness. He validates John's witness, and he sees the effect of receiving John's witness. So look at, just for a moment, these men 
are outraged with our Lord. In fact, look again at verse 16 and get the import of this. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Brethren, I have an admission or a, a confession to make. Somebody wants to kill me. I don't know that the first order of business in my heart is to see them saved. I'd like to think it's there. I'd like to think it would be there. I'd like to think it would be something I would want or ponder or desire. But I'm not sure I would be this robust in my assertion. Jesus says John's testimony is such that if you believe it, by the grace of God, you'll be saved. He wants his persecutors to be saved. He wants his oppressors to be saved. He wants his would-be murderers to be saved. This is a very instructive passage, and it's consistent with Paul's uh, 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 exhortation in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We pray for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead peaceable and quiet lives in all godliness. Well, if we ask the question in context there, what do we pray for? We pray for their salvation. We pray that, that God opens the heart of Justin Trudeau and brings him out of darkness into marvelous light. We pray that for the several premiers in Canada. We pray that for the Biden administration. We pray that for the Chinese communists. We pray that God saves them. Now, as you know, there are other prayers that we can legitimately offer up. But in this particular context, Jesus is underscoring the, the, the validity and legitimacy of praying even for those who persecute you. Praying even for those who want to destroy you. Praying for those who want to murder you. Who are falsely alleging things that are not true and want to, 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 to see you dead as a result of their wickedness and of their unrighteousness. Paul the Apostle summarizes John's ministry. He says, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. That's in Acts 19 in Ephesus. That's a great summary statement of John's ministry. John's a bit of a peculiar character at times for some of the people of God in the church. I mean, he eats funny things and he dresses in funny clothes. Well, he looks like Elijah the prophet in a new covenant setting. But his testimony or his preaching or his declaration or his ministry is gospel ministry. He wants you to believe on the Lord Jesus. He wants you to repent from your sins. And so Jesus invokes the testimony of John, not only to corroborate what he has said in terms of his equality with the Father, but he wants them to be saved. You should have listened to John. You should receive what he has to say, because then by grace you pass from death unto life. Now notice he doesn't stop there. He describes John's ministry in more detail. Verse 35, he was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. The Baptist preached the truth. That's what I think, or at least the reform commentary for the most part has seen light as truth and heat as earnestness. In other words, if this truth is in your heart, it has to get out. If this truth is in your heart, you will proclaim it. If this truth is in the place where it ought to be, you're not going to leave it there. And when you preach it, you're not going to do it as some chatty pastor today with his hand in his pocket and his latte in the other hand, in his holy jeans and his cool hip sort of Jesus talk. No, John the Baptist was a burning and shining lamp. He proclaimed the truth as it is in Jesus. And again, look at what Jesus says concerning their reception of it. Verse 35, he was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. You were willing for a time. There was a curiosity about him. There was something about him that drew you. There was something about him that intrigued you or interested you. It was likely when he started saying things like, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, or Jesus is the Son of God, or he must increase and I must decrease. It's probably at that particular time they said, oh, this he's a madman, we don't want anything to do with him. The Jesus that he preaches, they had an axe to grind with. So Christ invokes the witness testimony of John the Baptist in the first place. Now notice secondly, the testimony of Jesus works in verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now the works of Jesus are a greater witness, a greater testimony 
to the person of Jesus than even is the, the, the testimony of John the Baptist. And the works were given him by the Father in order that he might accomplish that. In other words, the Father sends the Son into the world, and one of the things he does in terms of his earthly ministry is heal the uh, uh, paralyzed men like he did in chapter 5 at verses 1 to 15. Those are the mighty works that Jesus was about. Now, if we ask the question, didn't other people do mighty works? I mean, think back in the Old Testament when Moses appears before Pharaoh. What happens? They throw down the rod and it turns into a serpent. Uh, the, uh, Moses tells Pharaoh to put his hand into his, his, his uh, garment and he takes it out and it's leprous. Moses was a man of God, a prophet of God, and as a result, he did the works of God. You had Elijah, the prophet, who did miracles. You had Elisha, the prophet, who in many ways is one of the most significant types of our Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. You had the prophets do miracles of God. And then after the ministry of our Lord Jesus, the apostles did the works of God. So persons might say, well, what's the difference? Jesus' works are consistent with one sent from God. Well, I would offer up two reasons why they're different. In the first place, Moses and Elisha and the apostles never claimed equality with God. They didn't do these things and say, therefore, I am the son of God and therefore consubstantial with him. They didn't do that. That is a significant difference. Jesus did that. And those men were, in fact, again, by adoption, by creation, sons of God, but they weren't sons of God by nature. That's the difference in terms of the works of the Lord Jesus. When we see those works, they confirm, yes, the glory of Christ as mediator, but it confirms as well the glory of Christ as consubstantial with the Father. And so Jesus makes that emphasis in verse 36. I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, notice, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. That's a big issue in this section. That's a big issue in all of John's gospel. This having been sent from the Father reflects something concerning theology. It's the Father who sends the Son. The Father is the one who eternally generates the Son. The Son is sent by the Father, and these works confirm that particular relation. These works confirm that Jesus is Son of God by nature in a way that Moses and Elisha and Elijah were not. The function of Christ's work were to confirm his eternal generation from the Father, and hence the works confirm that he is equal with the Father. Now notice thirdly, the testimony of the Father. You see what Jesus is doing? Sometimes I think we read the Bible and we kind of wonder, what is he doing here? Well, he's answering the charges. He is answering the specific allegations that he is guilty of two capital offenses. Brethren, he's not only very God of very God, he is very man of very man. And as man, again, he respects due process. And as man, he uses those legitimate means that God has given to redress sinful accusations and things that could land us in hot water. So he gives the testimony now of the Father in verses 37 to 38. Notice in the first place, the testimony of the Father to the Son. Now, it would be wrong to limit this to Matthew 3, Matthew 17, but it's not wrong to illustrate with Matthew 3 and Matthew 17. Matthew 3, at the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, when the Spirit descends upon the Savior and the voice of the Father, the voice of approbation comes, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He has testified of His Son. At the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew chapter 17, at verse 5, Jesus, as it were, displays His divinity, and then the voice of the Father comes and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. John the Apostle, the author of John's Gospel, says in his first epistle, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. So he confirms that. Verse 37, the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. Do you think they're getting happier as he answers? Do you think they're getting more won over the when, as he proceeds? We're upset. We want to kill you because you're making yourself equal with God. Absolutely, positively, I am equal with God. Not only in my own relation to the Father, not only in my own God-befitting functions as sovereign over life and, and, and judgment, 
but with reference to the various testimonies, not only from John the Baptist, not only from the works that I do, but from the Father, the very Father that you say you serve, the very Father that you say you worship, the very Father you say or claim to, to, to glorify. And now notice in verse 37, he says, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Perhaps there's an allusion to Deuteronomy 4.12. Deuteronomy 4.12, and Yahweh spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So that is a, a, a very biblical and a very acute ab observation. God is spirit and does not have a body like men. This is one of the reasons for the prohibition against idolatry. We're not supposed to fashion something, even in the, uh, 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 according to the true and living God, that is creature, because God is not creature, and to try to contain him in golden calves simply cannot do. But what Jesus is saying, not only have you not seen his form, but you've not heard his voice. Now, brethren, this would be a big challenge to these people. Right? They were brought up in the synagogue. These are most likely leaders, or some of them, that were quite in tune with the scriptures. These, these were the kinds of guys that, that wore phylacteries. Those were little boxes that you wore on your, on your arm or you put it around your head, and in those boxes were scripture texts. So they knew the scripture. They understand the word of God. They understand the, the, the reality of Yahweh of Israel having created all things and having been the, the governor of all things. The God of Israel being covenant Lord. The God of Israel being the one who saves his people. But with reference to Jesus' condemnation here, he affirms, you don't know him. You don't have him. What do you think he's uh, 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 saying? It's going back to chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Look at what he says in verse 23. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. So dropping down to verse 38 or verse 37, when he says, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, he goes on to elaborate or explain this, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. See, for all the vague sort of spirituality that exists in our world, it's all a bunch of garbage if it is not rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I have a relationship with God as I understand him. You know what really doesn't matter in life is as you understand him. What matters is the revelation of God from Genesis to the book of Revelation the true and living God, the one from everlasting to everlasting, the God who made beautiful days like these, the God who governs all his creatures and all their actions, and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who saves his people from their sins. That's the only God there is. So this vague notion that I have a relationship with God, but I'm not so interested in Jesus Christ is just like empty, futile words. Look at what the Son of God says in verse 38. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. In other words, if you reject the Son of God, who is Son by nature, who is consubstantial with the Father, then you are, in effect, rejecting the Father. It's a pretty simple concept, really. Aquinas says, consequently, anyone who does not believe that he is the Son of God does not believe in the testimony of God. It's a very simple, logical exercise. You reject the one whom the Father sent, therefore you've rejected the Father himself. And again, brethren, I do not think for a moment he is winning them over to his side. Because in verses, at the end of the chapter, in verses 41 to 47, he continues his indictment, he continues his rebuke, he continues his reproof of them, and says, Moses himself will bring the charge against you. Why? Because Moses wrote about me. Moses is that final testifier or witness. And when you say, oh, we love Moses and we love the prophets, but you have no regard for the Son of God, then you are saying, in essence, we have no regard for Moses and no regard for the prophets. I think it's pretty simple logic that Christ is employing with these particular men. Now notice, fourthly and finally, in terms of the witness, the testimony of Scripture, verses 39 and 40. He speaks of their willingness to search the Scriptures, and then he speaks 
speaks to their unwillingness to come to the Son. Again, it's a paradox. If the Scriptures exist to point us to Jesus, and we don't come to Jesus, then we really don't care about the Scriptures. I'm not trying to make this overly simple, but that's how simple it is in terms of his approach to these particular leaders or these particular Jews. Look at what he says in verse 39. You search the scriptures. It's not a command here. It's not an imperative. It could, be, it could go that uh, either way, either an imperative or an indicative, but it's an indicative. He's not saying, I want you to search the scriptures. I want you to learn of me. I want you to find out what Moses and the prophets said. No, he's speaking to something that was their practice. You search the scriptures. You investigate them. You examine them. Again, they wore phylacteries. They went to the synagogue. They were about the Torah and about the prophets. They were about the writings. They, they were very curious about what Isaiah had to say, very curious about Obadiah, about Jonah, about Micah, very curious about the kings and, and chronicles and first and second Samuel. They weren't like us in many respects because they actually searched the Bible far more than modern Christians do in the, 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 the world in which we live. So he says, you search the scriptures and then he gives the reason why. You search them, why? Because in them you think you have eternal life. Again, that's a good thing, right? If I wanted to find out how to plumb, I would go get a book on plumbing. If I wanted to find out how to you know, do something electrical, I'd call Lucas or Benjamin. If I wanted to learn how to fix a car, I'd go online or Google. If I want something about eternal life, I go to the Bible. This is a good thing, right? The Bible holds the words of everlasting life. It tells us of a holy God. It tells us of sinful man. And it tells us of God's provision in the person and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus acknowledges this. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But then notice the issue. Notice the rub. Notice the problem. You do all this searching. You're looking for eternal life. But you've missed this fundamental point. These are they which testify of me. Big problem. Again, you guys have read Moses. You've read the prophets. You've read the writings. You've searched for eternal life. And all those things have converged at this very moment in redemptive history, in the coming of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You search those scriptures. You think in them you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. That does a great deal with reference to those people. I am sure they did not like this one bit. We don't get sort of their response at the end of chapter five. We get it at the end of chapter 10, where there's a similar construct, where Jesus there is accused of making himself equal with God. I wonder why. Because in John 10, 30, he says, I and the Father are one. How many times do we need to hear this, right? Jesus is God. This isn't made up. This wasn't Nicaea that put this together. Nicaea only confirms what the Bible teaches concerning our blessed triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in John 10, after he makes that assertion, what do they do? They get outraged again because he made himself equal with God, and then they take up stones to throw at him. Same sort of thing in John chapter 8. So probably here at the end of John 5, after giving them these sort of truth bombs or red pills or whatever we want to call them, they did not like this. And I'm sure they did not like verse 39. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now that's an interesting statement. The Bible illustrates that further. Christ is the scope of scripture. Christ is the telos. Christ is the purpose. Christ is the reason. There's a comment on Ruth chapter 4, verses 17 to 22 that I want to read. It sort of summarizes this. You might go, why Ruth chapter 4? You know what the point of Ruth is? <laughs> it's Ruth chapter 4, verses 17 to 22. It's not the love story. It's a beautiful love story. I mean, I could see it today. All the women reading those romance novels. Oh, Ruth, what a wonderful woman. What a virtuous woman. And a virtuous woman she was. She's mentioned that way twice in the book of Ruth. In the Jewish canon, you've got Ruth, then Proverbs, right? Proverbs is the, uh, Proverbs 31 is the virtuous woman. Well, with reference to Ruth, it's all about the genealogy. It's all about the end. It's all about the end game and how it connects us to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
John Gill says, with reference to this brief comment in Ruth 4, the principal design of it is to give the genealogy of David, whom Samuel had anointed to be king of Israel, and from whom the Messiah was to come, and who therefore may be said to be the aim and scope of it, as he is all of Scripture, and whereby it appears that he sprung from both Jews and Gentiles, and is Savior of both, and there is good foundation for both to hope in him. And the call and conversion of Ruth the Moabitess may be considered as a shadow, emblem, and pledge of the conversion of the Gentiles. But you see Jesus' emphasis on Jesus being scope of the scriptures in Luke's gospel. You can turn there. It's very close. Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. Notice what Jesus says in verse 25. Then, Jesus, or then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning what? Concerning himself. Verse 44, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning what? Concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Remember Peter preaching to the household of, uh, of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 43. He says to him, Jesus Christ, do all the uh, prophets testify or witness that whoever believes in his name will have everlasting life. Christ is scope of the scriptures, and that's what he says to these Jews. And then he uh, ends on this note, at least in our sermon this morning, and you're probably happy to hear that. Verse 40, but you are not willing. So they have this willingness to search the scriptures. They have this willingness to find eternal life. Unfortunately for them, it leads them to the one they presently want to murder. That kind of is a conundrum for them and a bit of an enigma. And then he highlights this reality in their setting. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. The unconverted Jews miss the point of the Bible. The unconverted Jews miss the point of Moses and the prophets. They missed it not by a little bit, just kind of almost. They missed it by a mile. As well, the coming to the Son that he refers to. Notice, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. The willing or the coming to the Son is for eternal life. You hear about, you know, Christians talking about faith in Jesus, believe on Jesus. That's what it means to come to Jesus. Notice in the next chapter, in John chapter 6, several times, he alludes to this. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Again, in verse 37, he says, all that the Father gives me will what? Will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets, all they that all they shall, uh, and they shall all be taught of God, or taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And then again in verse 65, same emphasis, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. So this idea of coming to Jesus, if you're not a believer here this morning, this is the point. Coming to Jesus doesn't mean you get in a rocket ship and fly to heaven and find Jesus. It means to believe the gospel. It means to stop looking at yourself. It means to stop looking at your so-called good works. It means to stop thinking, well, you know, I'm not that bad, so I'll probably make it into heaven. No, you are that bad. You're a whole lot worse than you can even imagine. The Bible will tell you about that if you give it a time. Give it some time to do so. It is faith in our Lord it is belief in the gospel of our Lord. People here that are going to heaven are not going to heaven because they're good. They're not going to heaven because they're righteous. They're not going to heaven because they keep God's law every jot and tittle. They're going to heaven because Jesus is good, because Jesus is righteous, because Jesus kept the law every jot and tittle. And by grace, the people here going to heaven have believed in him. And when you believe in him, you're both cleansed in his blood and clothed in his righteousness. It is most glorious and most wonderful. And when Jesus says, you are not willing to come to me that you may have life, he is not celebrating man's free will. He is condemning that will. He is indicting that will. Now, it's a common fallacy that the Reformed reject the notion of free will. We don't reject the notion of free will at all. 
But we see that there are differences in terms of the state of man. Man in his original integrity before he fell, his free will was such that he could do both good and bad. Man in a state of sin only can do that which is bad. Man in a state of grace, again, has been restored to a place where he's able to do that which is good, and he still struggles doing that which is bad. And then the state of man in glory. His will is confirmed only to do the good. So it's not a negation of free will among the reformed. It's a qualification of free will among the reformed that is most crucial. But in this passage, he is not saying to them that it's your free will alone, unaided by the power of the Holy Spirit, that will bring you out of darkness into life. No, he's simply making the observation. Man's will is bound by his wicked heart. And their wicked heart was on full display in the fact that they wanted to destroy him, who was, in fact, the Son of God by nature, testified to by the Baptist, his own works, the Father, and the Scriptures that they themselves said they had allegiance unto. John Gill speaks to this issue in terms of free will. He says, In such the depravity, perverseness, and stubbornness of their wills, that they had no inclination, desire, and will to come to Christ, any more than power, which is an argument against and not for the free will of man, unless it be that which is evil. He says, yeah, it's an argument for free will, if you, only under, if you understand, unto evil. Man's heart is affected, or man's will, rather, is affected by his heart. And if the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and no one can understand it, that argues what John teaches us in John 3, or Jesus teaches us in John 3, you must be born again. So Christ ends the dispute, not here, but he will, God willing, in our study next week, with rebuke, with indictment, and with reproof. Well, just a couple of observations and then we'll go. First, the wretched state of these unbelieving Jews. What a bad place to be, right? You've, you've lived your life, you've gone to synagogue, you've gone to you know, rabbi school, you've, lo- you've learned, you've studied Torah, you've studied the prophets, you've studied the rabbis, and you've missed everything they had to say. You, you've missed it by, by a million miles. The searching of scripture for eternal life and completely missing the point. See, if that's you and you're not saved and you're sort of reading the scriptures, uh, ponder this passage. Ponder that, that Jesus is in the Old Testament. It's a bad thing today that we're only giving people New Testaments. We need the Old Testament too. The Old Testament is as much full of Christ as is the New Testament. And if we are shortchanging them with information concerning Christ, that's not good. Perhaps you've read recently where the CDC hid data with reference to COVID-19. That's atrocious. That's horrifying. But do we do that in the church with persons concerning Jesus? Give them whole Bibles. Brethren, we're rich enough, wealthy enough to buy both Testaments to give to our unconverted friends. Search the scriptures with this mindset. They tell me and they lead me to Jesus. It's about Christ. If you don't have Christ, you don't have life. And that's the the horrible state these Jews find themselves in. Secondly, and I want to camp on this just for a moment because I don't ever want to leave without holding up the Baptist as a good example. Not in terms of his ecclesiology, but in terms of his ministry. Kind of goes along with what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy was to be the kind of man that was bold and courageous in the midst of suffering and persecution and oppression. John the Baptist was that kind of man. When Jesus is asked, or when John sends a delegation, John's in prison, the Baptist, and he asks Jesus, are you the Christ? Are you the coming one? Or do we wait for another? He's not actually wondering concerning the identity of Jesus. He knows the identity of Jesus, but he knows the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah says that consistent with the coming of the Messiah, there will be healing. There will be blessing, there will be liberty, there will be joy. Well, John the Baptist is in a prison. He's probably thinking to himself, if this is the time of Messiah, then what is a good guy like me sitting in a prison cell? So Jesus then praises the ministry of John the Baptist. In fact, turn to Matthew chapter 11. This is the kind of guy you should pray for in terms of eldership, in terms of missions, in terms of pastoring, in terms of preaching. The world has enough effeminate Nancy boys standing in pulpits with their hands in their pockets. We need John the Baptists. We need Timothys. We need Pauls. 
Notice in verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go, tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, uh, 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 dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So go answer John. Go answer John the Baptist. Tell him this is what Isaiah spoke of, because these things are consistent with the ministry of Messiah. Now notice in verse 7, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Did you go out to see a Nancy? Did you go out to see an effeminate man? Did you go out to see somebody who was easily knocked off his game by the prevailing winds of doctrine? No, you didn't go out to see a reed shaken by the wind. You went out to see a man who is going to tell you 16 ounces to the pound, biblical truth every time he opens his mouth. And then notice in verse 8, but what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Probably a reference to court prophets. Remember, the, pro or the kings would, would hire men that would tell them what they wanted them to hear. That instance in 1 Samuel, uh, first, uh, yeah, 1 Samuel chapter 22 with Ahab and, with, uh, uh, Ahab and, and Jehoshaphat. And Ahab wants an alliance with Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat says, well, uh, uh, going against uh, uh, Syria in war. So Jehoshaphat says, are there any prophets to sort of confirm this decision? And so they trot out all the court prophets. And all the court prophets say, oh, yeah, go into battle. Certainly you're going to win. And then Jehoshaphat, probably a little bit suspicious by this consistent testimony, he says, is there no one else? Ahab sullenly says, well, yeah, there is this one. He never tells me what I want to hear. He doesn't tell me what I want. <laughs> And then Jehoshaphat thankfully says, well, let, let's probably hear what he has to say. So Micaiah comes and tells him, you're going to die on the battlefield, Ahab. You know what that got him? Did it get him a promotion? Did it get him a new car? Did it get him a wife with big hair? No, it got him jail time and bread and water. So the Baptist was not a court prophet. Verse 9, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. Now, when we pray for pastors, we pray for missionaries, we pray for elders to be raised up in our churches, they're not going to be the same as the Baptist in terms of his role or function in redemptive his history. He's not, that's just not. But in terms of the spirit and the power of, a, of John the Baptist, that, that burning and shining lamp, Brethren, we have the word of God. We have the theological goods. We have the truth as it is in Jesus. What do we do with that? We preach it. We proclaim it. We herald it. We thunder it. The voice of Yahweh crushes the cedars of Lebanon, according to Psalm 29. The voice of Yahweh in the scriptures of the New Old and New Testament crushes the hardened hearts of men and women and boys and girls. So what do we do? We proclaim it. We pray for God to raise up men to proclaim it. Of course, we see, thirdly, the glory of the only begotten Son. The consistent testimony of John the Apostle from the very beginning to the very end of his gospel, minute, uh, 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 gospel record is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that testimony is upheld, not just in the prologue and not just in John's sort of ending statement, John 20, 30, and 31, but it's in the life and ministry of Jesus. So what you see in the prologue in chapter 1 is what you see in the ministry in chapter 5. The economy reveals to us something concerning the theology. The economy underscores what is true in the theology. And it underscores this fact that Christ is the second person of the Trinity, that Christ came and dwelt among us, that Christ lived in obedience to the Father's law, that he died as a substitute and as a sacrifice to function as the Lamb of God. And then Christ was raised the third day such that all who believe in him will have everlasting life. Now, brethren, don't make the mistake, or friend, don't make the mistake of these Jews. Don't make the mistake of just, you know, discounting this, just rejecting this. We had an interesting thing happen over the weekend. The, some of the little grandkids came and stayed with us. And one of the little grandkids, she's the cute blonde you see bouncing around in here. She wears glasses. And my beloved said, she's pretty protective of those glasses. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, whenever she takes them off, she uses two hands. Kid's three and a half. I mean, I still, you know, bend them or whatever, take them off. And, 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 and when she takes them off, she carefully lays them on the table. Three and a half. And I was thinking about this this morning. I thought there's probably one of three reasons why she does that. First, parental pressure. If I bought my children things that cost lots of money, I threatened them. I said, don't break these because they cost me a lot of money. 
Second is intellectual. My wife and I are convinced she's a genius, so I think that you know, bright people don't break things. But the third I thought was probably more appropriate. It's practical. It's practical. She knows the value of the remedy because she understands the gravity of the problem. See, without those glasses, she doesn't see very well. They said when she got those glasses and put them on, it was like, wow, right? This is great. Well, when something helps you like that, you guard it. You see the value of the remedy, and therefore you understand, or because of that value of the remedy, it's, it's closely connected to the gravity of the situation. I suspect that many here have a concept of sin. Sin is what those guys out there do. Sin is a little bit of what I do because I'm not perfect. I, I, I do try, and if all things being equal and God grades on a curve, I'll probably make it, and I've never murdered, I've never committed adultery. You don't understand the gravity of the problem. You don't understand what Westminster Catechism says. What does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's curse and wrath, both in this life and that which is to come. When you understand the sin problem, Jesus is then altogether lovely and chief among 10,000. When you understand that you have transgressed God's law, not just a little bit, but every jot and tittle. When you understand that you lack that conformity that God calls you to, then Jesus comes as that blessed Savior, as that blessed Redeemer, as that blessed Lord and Son of God, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You've got big problems today if you're not a Christian. And those big problems, problems are going to land you in hell. And the only escape is through the one that is testifying in the scripture here that he is equal with his father. And that he has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Look to him in faith. Use the idea that we see here in verse 40. Come to him by grace through faith and you will have everlasting life. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the gospel of our salvation. And God, we do pray that you would undertake on behalf of sinners, bring conviction for sin and set before them the blessed Christ, the one who is able to save to the uttermost all who draw nigh unto you through faith in him. We ask that you would look with favor upon this world, that you would send forth your glorious gospel, conquering and to conquer. And we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing 568 in praise to our great and triune God. of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Father, we pray that these things would be true for each of us, that we would know this experientially by your grace and for your glory. God, we pray that all over the earth as the gospel goes forth, you'd open hearts to the, the grim reality of sin and its consequences and set forth the glory of Jesus Christ and his power and ability to save sinners. And in this, God, we pray that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be glorified, would be exalted, and would be praised. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated for a brief time of meditation.